Good morning and welcome to Christ Community Church Live. My name is David Gould. I'm one of the volunteers here at Christ Community Church. This is my new favorite shirt and we are so thankful you decided to be a part of our service today. God, we thank you for your presence in our lives, that you are near to us in our times of trouble, God, that we can seek you and find you. And I pray that all of us gathered here today, whether you're in the church, whether you're at your homes, that you can just truly lay your burdens down at the foot of the cross and worship God freely, church. Let's praise him together.
we're so humbled, God, by your love for us, that you choose to love us, God, despite our flaws, our mistakes, and everything in between. You still cover us with your grace and mercy. So worship him, church, because God is so worthy of it.
Hey, good morning, Christ Community Church. I hope that your Sunday is off to a great start. Uh, just wanted to update you on some exciting developments in the life of our church. This past Monday evening, Pastor Al and I met together with our elders and with uh, a number of the key leaders from our church to map out a path forward for what it's going to look like for us to begin gathering together again as a church on Sunday mornings. And there were a lot of questions, a lot of things that we had to take into account. I want to say up front, I am so grateful for these leaders. I am so grateful for their love for Christ Community Church, for their commitment to helping us move forward into the future together. And we're excited to be able to share with you some of the phases of, of how we believe that the Lord is leading us to move forward as a church over these next few months. As is much of society, we're going to be taking a phased approach to reopening, and we just want to share briefly with you what those phases are going to look like today. The first phase, phase one of our reopening, actually starts next Sunday, next Sunday, July 26th. And, and the way that we're going to do that is we're, we're going to begin by having Sunday morning watch parties. Now, you might be wondering, what in the world is a watch party? It's very simple. Here's what it is. We simply want to encourage you to gather together with a few other people, to watch the, the service through Facebook Live, and to worship together. So that might mean having a few other people over to your place. Uh, it might mean you going over to someone else's house. Maybe it's an opportunity to invite uh, a friend, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor who, who, who doesn't know Jesus or isn't connected to the church to come and to, to watch the feed with you. Now, obviously, none of us have probably done these watch parties before. So let me just give you a few tips to help make this go well. First thing I want to encourage you to do is to engage in worship together, to really engage in worship together. And here's what I mean by that. I mean that I want to encourage you not to just watch the service. Let's sing together as the band leads us in worship. Let's pray together. Let's listen to the sermon together. Let's be as engaged as possible it will probably feel a little bit awkward at first, but you'll get used to it over time. So first, let's engage in worship together. Second thing I want to encourage us to do is to be sensitive to other people's level of comfort. Be sensitive to other people's level of comfort. Some of us might not feel comfortable gathering together with people at this stage, and that's okay. Maybe, maybe you have some health concerns. Maybe someone in your family is vulnerable. And the last thing we want you to feel is any pressure about getting together. So even as we're inviting other folks to join us, let's be sensitive that some other folks might not be able to join us at this time. And let's continue to reach out to one another, even if we can't gather together. And the final thing I want to encourage us with is let's have fun. Let's make this fun. This is an opportunity to get together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially at a time when, when maybe we're not able to see each other as often. So, so make it fun, whatever that looks like for you. Maybe you want to do brunch together. Maybe you want to carve out some time to connect and talk with one another. Uh, if you're a parent of young kids like I am, maybe you just want to let your kids play together while you attempt to have a civilized adult conversation. But whatever that looks like, we don't want this to be a burden for you. We want it to be a life-giving time. So feel the freedom to adapt it, to shape it in a way that makes it fun for you. So phase one, watch parties. That starts next Sunday, July 26th. And we'll be in phase one for five weeks. And then Lord willing, we'll move into phase two on August 30th. And I am so excited for phase two because phase two will be when we begin gathering together as an entire church body for outdoor worship gatherings. And we'll be telling you more of the specifics as that date approaches, but you can go ahead and mark this on your calendar. August 30th, 10 a.m., we're going to be gathering together to worship outdoors at our campus at 219 Berry Road. And we'll be doing that, Lord willing, for five weeks. We'll do that the last Sunday of August and all four Sundays of September. And then on October 4th, when the weather starts to get probably a bit cooler, uh, we're going to move into phase three. And phase three is where we begin moving back indoors for worship. And in some ways, it's going to look different than it has in the past for us. 
Uh, in other ways, it's going to be what the church has been doing for the past 2,000 years. And we're going to give you more details on that as that date approaches. Now, obviously, none of us knows the future. So we, we might need to adapt these plans as we move through these phases. But here's what I want to encourage you with. We might be surprised about COVID-19. We might be surprised about some things that come up along the way. But God is not surprised by COVID-19. God is not surprised by anything that is going on in our world. Jesus has been building his church for 2,000 years, and he's going to use even this to advance his gospel and to build his church. So let's move forward hopefully and confidently and expectantly into the future that he has for us. We're going to be moving into our sermon time now. Pa Pastor Al will be preaching for us today on where to find help in times of temptation. And then next Sunday, he'll be delivering his final message to us as interim pastor. So make sure to tune in for that. You won't want to miss it. So let's pray. And then let's look forward expectantly to the preaching of God's word. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are in control of all things. We thank you that there is not one maverick molecule in the entire universe, that you are sovereign over COVID-19, that you are sovereign over everything in the world, and that you are sovereign over everything in our lives. And we thank you that not only are you in control, but you love us and you care deeply about us. And so we can trust you. And so we look forward to the opportunity to gather together again with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We look forward to moving through these phases, and yet at the same time, we trust you. We trust you that you will continue to build this church, even if it doesn't look like what we had always expected us to look like. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have spoken to us. I pray for Pastor Al as he comes to preach to us now. We pray that you would give us ears to hear what you are saying to us, that you would give us hearts to worship you in lives that are ready to respond in obedience to your word and in trust in Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh. We'll be praying for you as you launch your ministry in August, and we're going to see some amazing things despite COVID-19. We're in a three-week series called Help. In the first sermon, we looked at help when God seems distant. In the second sermon, we looked at help when you're afraid. If you missed those two sermons, it would do you well to listen to them on our Facebook page, Christ Community Church, Fredonia. Today, we're going to look at something we all have in common, temptation. If we don't know how to get help or if we don't avail ourselves of help, we're going to yield often to temptation, and we're going to live a defeated life. The most classic case of temptation in the Bible is when the devil tempted Christ in the Judean wilderness. The mountain you're seeing right now is called the Mount of Temptation in Israel. Now, we don't know if this was the specific mountain, but it's in the general area where Christ was tempted. I gave a talk on temptation on this very mountain. I'll never forget it. The full fury of hell came upon Jesus here early in his ministry to derail him. You need to know that Satan attempts to derail us as well. And we need to take a close look at how Jesus got the victory. Please listen as I read the account in Luke 4 verses 1 through 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, 
It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. Well, many of us are familiar with the temptations of Christ by the devil in the Gospels, but just in case it's been a while since you've looked at this episode, let me review. In temptation number one, the devil prompted Jesus to satisfy his extreme physical hunger by making bread out of stones, verses three and four. Now, nothing was wrong with Jesus doing that, except it wasn't God's will. The fact that something isn't wrong doesn't mean it's right for us. In the second temptation, the devil offered premature earthly power and glory if Jesus would only bow the knee to worship him, verses 5 through 8. Now, Jesus could have had the kingdoms of this world right then and there on easy terms. No cross. How often Satan wants to take the easy way with us if we're headed in the wrong direction by bypassing the necessary steps so we can be happy now while we forfeit our integrity. In temptation three, the devil tried to entice Jesus to do a stupid thing, jump off a high corner on the temple wall, verses nine through 12, to the Kidron Valley, 400 feet below. It was a challenge to see if God would really rescue him like he said he would in the Old Testament. How often we make poor decisions when tempted. And God's work in the world is not primarily about cleaning up our messes. Praise God. Jesus had the victory over each temptation, or none of us could be saved. A sinless Christ on the cross was required for our salvation. And not only that, none of us would have any hope in help with our temptations. If Christ had been defeated, he couldn't be of help to us when we are tempted. Now, if Jesus had this kind of success when he was tempted, don't you think that we can learn a great deal from his experience with temptation? Absolutely. And that's where I'm heading in this sermon. So here's the big idea. As followers of Jesus, we need to handle temptation like he did. I want to say that again. As followers of Jesus, we need to handle temptation like he did. The episode we just looked at is full of helpful lessons to give us victory over temptation and the devil. We're going to go take a look at seven of those lessons, and here we go. Lesson number one, we need to understand the nature of temptation. We need to know what temptation is all about. Jesus did. Therefore, he was able to stand against temptation and the devil. So I want to spend a little time on this lesson because the idea of temptation has been watered down in our culture, even in the church. We often think about temptation, for instance, as wanting something to eat that's really, really good, but it has too many calories. I'm tempted to eat it. But we rarely think about temptation in terms of violating the commands and will of God. So, what is temptation? The word temptation has two meanings in the New Testament. The first one has to do with a test. It's used of precious metals that are tested by fire to see if they'll hold up as the real thing. In like fashion, there are times when people are tested to demonstrate their true character. Not only that, the purpose of testing metals and in people is to remove impurities. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about the second meaning of the word temptation. In this sense, temptation means enticement to sin. In other words, temptation involves strong, illicit desire. You have a powerful desire for something you shouldn't have or do. Something that God forbids. Something that's not in the will of God. The insidious thing about desire is this. It doesn't always play to classic sin. It can play to our desire for good things outside the will of God. You see, the devil tempted Jesus only once to violate the scriptures, and that was to worship Satan instead of God. The other two temptations were for things that couldn't, that could have been okay, except they were outside the will of God for Jesus at that time. So we must be very careful about our desires Every time we feel some kind of desire within that we know to be temptation, it's like a bell or whistle going off. 
We need to get ready to battle back just like Christ did in the wilderness. Well, now that we know the nature of temptation, I want to say three things that will encourage you. Number one, temptation isn't sin. We can choose not to sin, but we can't choose not to be tempted. We're all tempted, but temptation isn't a sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way we are, yet without sin. Now, with all the temptations we have, how many are glad that temptation isn't a sin? We sin enough as it is. It's when we yield to temptation that it becomes a sin. You can be tempted to do the worst thing in the world and not sin, but to give in to temptation is sin. As Billy Graham once said, you can't prevent a bird from landing on your head, but you can prevent it from building a nest. Temptation is the bird landing on your head. There's no sin there. The sin is to let temptation build its nest on your head and therefore, therefore fulfill the desires of the flesh. Number two, and I love this one, temptation isn't unique. Never think the temptation you're struggling with is the only one anybody has ever felt, no one besides you. It is not unique to you. Other people have dealt with the same temptations that you have. Listen, you can't have a temptation that many others haven't had, including people in our church. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. So don't think you're alone and weird and terrible in the midst of temptation. And number three, Temptation is not from God. James 1.13 says that God will never tempt anyone to do something evil or contrary to his will. The chairman of the board of temptation is Satan. Satan is always in the mix when temptation is in progress. And Satan was the ringleader of the three temptations of Christ. And Satan is the ringleader when we are tempted. Well, now that we have an understanding of temptation, let's look at lesson number two. We need to be on the alert for temptation after a spiritual high. What preceded the temptations of Christ? His baptism. Now, if you've ever been baptized, you know that it's a very special spiritual event. It's a tremendous blessing. The baptism of Jesus launched his public ministry. The Father gave his open support to his Son. He was on a definite spiritual high, and the next thing Christ knows, he's in the wilderness facing temptation. You can take this to the bank. Strong temptation is never too far behind a spiritual high. I've experienced that time and again over the years. The devil knows we can be caught off guard after a spiritual high. In fact, we're given a special caution about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, where it says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. So when you have a great spiritual experience at church, at a retreat, at a seminar, or alone with God, put up your guard. Satan loves to come to us with temptation when we are on a high or when we're feeling strong. Thank God for every spiritual high you can get. But just remember, it's a perfect opportunity for Satan to set up shop. Lesson number three, we need to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Verse one says that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit when he went into the wilderness. And that wasn't something just for Jesus to be full of the Spirit. In the book of Acts and in several of Paul's epistles, we are told to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to walk by means of the Spirit. It ought to be the way we live our lives daily, full of the Spirit. Friends, living in the fullness of the Spirit is the strongest position to be in when we're tempted. When you're full of the Spirit, you have a powerful edge over temptation. It's like having a vaccination against a disease. What does it mean to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? It means that you're not living in known sin. It means that you surrender to the rule of God in your life. You've given the Holy Spirit control. His power is at work in you, and you're not your own. Your own power is in the background. 
You're in close fellowship with God. You're in tune with the mind and heart of God. One of the rarer conversations in churches and among believers these days is being filled with the Holy Spirit. How we need to hear that more in our churches, because that's a bad sign. Daily, we need to ask ourselves, are we living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Listen, living in the fullness of the Spirit is the only way we should ever face our temptations. We have power over the devil when we're full of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what might have happened to Jesus had he not been full of the Spirit? He likely, wouldn't have, he likely would have sinned just like we do when we're not full of the Spirit. And when you face temptations and you're not full of the Holy Spirit, look out. We must make sure that we are living in the fullness of the Spirit every day. Now we come to lesson four. We need to identify our temptations. When you look at our text today, you see three specific areas of temptation. Jesus was fully aware of the temptations that were assailing him. But here's the problem. We're often not like Jesus. We don't stop often enough to identify our temptations. Too often we ignore them or rationalize them. And that makes us very vulnerable to falling. If we want victory over temptation, we must be honest with ourselves. We need to identify our major areas of temptation and admit that they are problems for us. So, what are your major areas of temptation? Overspending, overeating, not telling the truth, gossiping, lust, control, judging, too much social media, too much entertainment, sloth, pride, porn, name it and get it out there where you can deal with it. Now, once you identify your major areas of temptation, you're going to realize something. You'll recognize a pattern. And the devil will come to you often in the same areas. And once you figure that out, you're in a much better place to deal with temptation. So once we identify the various temptations we struggle with, we're ready for lesson number five. We need to speak quickly the appropriate scripture to the specific temptation. Christ, by example, showed us the most potent way to deal with temptation. Three times he was tempted, and three times he met the temptation head-on with an appropriate scripture and said, It is written. If the word of God is not your number one weapon in the fight with temptation, you'll lose a lot of battles. So please listen carefully to what I have to say. Why did I ask you to identify your major areas of temptation? Because there's an appropriate scripture for every one of your temptations. I'm serious. For every temptation you face, there's a scripture to combat it. Once you know where your weaknesses really lie and you admit them, you need to find at least one to two scriptures that speak directly to that temptation. Find them memorize them, know what they mean, pray them, meditate on them, make them part of your heart and your mind, get ready to use them. Now, when temptation comes, you're ready. You've got a potent weapon for the battle, and here's what you do. Access the appropriate scripture text and speak it forth from your heart, through your mouth, quote it aloud, immediately when the temptation comes. Notice I said immediately. Jesus didn't take his time fighting his desire and the voice of the tempter. As soon as he encountered the temptation, he spoke the word of God aloud. And the longer you wait to speak forth the word in temptation, the higher the odds that you'll succumb. You don't have a big window of time here. Friends, there's power in the spoken word of God in the face of temptation. I mean, just think how often the Lord spoke his word and something happened. All the way from creation when he spoke the word, to healing when he spoke the word, to raising the dead when he spoke the word. There's incredible power in the spoken word of God. Now, we need to realize that when we're tempted, we're not just dealing with illicit desire. We're dealing with the devil. And the word of God is the foremost weapon against Satan. 
He's no match for the sword of the Spirit. In each temptation, Christ battled back the temptation with the spoken word of God, and he gained the victory. So, when you feel a desire to do wrong, that's the cue that you need to speak aloud the appropriate scripture quickly to the specific situation. I mean, audibly verbalize the verse or verses just like Jesus did. Say, it is written, and take the sword of the Spirit and jab it in the face of the devil. The word of God is living and active and powerful, and it will deliver you from temptation if you keep your sword sharp. The bottom line is this. If you're going to have victory over temptation, you need to be a student of the word of God. You must learn it well enough to know the sections that deal with your temptations. But the sad truth is, many Christians know very little of the word. Therefore, they are no match for Satan and temptation. Friends, if you're going to know anything of consistent victory over temptation, you must be able to know and to speak the appropriate, powerful word of God to Satan. But there's another way to resist the devil. It's in lesson six. Command the devil to leave you if temptation persists. Now, Jesus allowed three temptations, but on the third one, he said, be gone, Satan. He verbally commanded Satan to leave him. And verse 11 says, the devil left him. This is all part of spiritual warfare, knowing that the devil will come to you repeatedly with temptation. So there are times you need to command the devil to leave you. Spiritual warfare like this is a grueling thing because temptation and the influence of Satan can really take a toll on us. And that's why 11 says that the angels came to minister to Jesus after this time. Now, if you need to take this step of commanding the devil to leave you, you'd better believe that the temptation battle is really intense. It's at this step that you need to contact a trusted friend or two and say, I have been assailed by temptation. It's been a rough battle. I've commanded Satan to leave me. I need you to stand with me for total victory. Now, why do I say this? Because the devil won't take no for an answer. It says that Satan departed from Christ all right, but verse 13 says he left until another opportune time. Temptation takes no vacation. It just finds other times to assail us. And so you need people to stand with you in those times. One more quick thing in this lesson. If you get to the place in temptation where you need to command the devil to leave you, you better be sure you're not hanging around the devil's territory. If you allow yourself to be in prime areas of temptation, you're already where the devil speaks and works. And telling him to take a hike won't really help unless you're willing to leave his territory. That means getting away from the very places you're tempted or by removing them from your house. The last lesson is lesson number seven. Ask Jesus for help in your struggle. Jesus didn't just go through his temptations so we could ch chat about them on Sunday mornings. He went through them so that he could be of assistance to us when we go through our temptations. Now, there's no way we can get an accurate understanding of the magnitude of Christ's temptations. On a scale of 1 to 10, his temptations were 100. Jesus was in the Judean wilderness for 40 days. I've seen that place. It's extremely hot, dry, and barren of vegetation. There are incredibly deep canyons and dangerous animals, and sometimes people get lost and die there. After fasting for 40 days, Jesus was at his limit. He was in a weakened and stressful state. It was incredible that he was even alive. Satan tried in the worst of environments to get Jesus to sin. And if Satan would have been successful, Jesus would have been disqualified as our Savior. And Satan would have had the victory and stopped the plan of God to redeem us, to redeem humanity. And all hope for us would have been lost. But Christ didn't bend. He didn't yield. He stood his ground in the worst of circumstances, more than we'll ever face. And in doing so, he became the source of help for anyone who is facing temptation. 
Listen to Hebrews 2.18. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And Hebrews 4, verses 15 through 16 say, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and we may find grace to help in our time of need. Friends, we're invited to call for Jesus when we're in the throes of temptation. He'll come to our rescue if we are serious. And he'll give us the power to say no to temptation. And he'll open up the way of escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. What a victory it is when Jesus and you score a win against temptation and the devil. Friends, I believe I've spoken to each of us today. We all face temptation. Even Jesus did. And from his classic struggle, we've learned seven critical lessons for victory. Apply these lessons and you can defeat the devil and spare yourself a whole lot of trouble. The reality is some of us are experiencing victory and we're doing very well. And some of us aren't doing so well. If temptation is getting the better of you, perhaps God has stirred your heart during this talk. Perhaps you've had an aha moment and you want to turn things around and have more victories over temptation than defeats. That's what this old hymn is about. Listen to the words. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the lessons from the life of our Lord, who was tempted, and he was able to be victorious over temptation and the devil. And so I pray that we would take these lessons to heart. I know it's probably the hardest thing we have to face in life, temptations and the battle against the devil. So, Father, help us to be full of the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to help each other be overcomers, and to be victorious more times than in defeat. And so I pray for every one of us in the battle that we would be strong in the power of the Lord, in whose name I pray. Amen. Well, until I see you for my last sermon at Christ Community Church next Sunday, yield not to temptation this week, and goodbye. If you're looking for more information on small groups, a chance to get to know our new pastor, Joshua Staley, and the rest of his family, or a chance for online giving, please visit our website at ChristCommunityFredonia.com. You'll also find our bulletin there, and you'll also find this information on our Facebook page. Thank you, and have an amazing week.